So I understand your pastor, as he said, was preaching through the lectionary readings. And um, so I said, well, I'll do the same. I'll just take the next reading. And then um, I looked at the wrong year. (laughs) I looked at next year's reading, which for this Sunday would be the Ten Commandments. But I'd already looked at it and started it, so I said, "Uh, whatever, I'm going to do the Ten Commandments. Uh, (laughs) This is Lent, and it's perfectly appropriate that we take time to meditate on the law of God during this time. James 1, the end of James chapter 1, he calls the law the mature law, or sometimes perfect law, the law of liberty, the law that brings freedom. And so this morning we're going to meditate on how the law, how the ten words, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, brings to a community freedom and liberty. And if we are doers of the law, we will be blessed. Let me open with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your law. It is glorious. It is life-giving. Sometimes we are used to thinking the law only in its capacity as uh, that which condemns us before you. But we We have acknowledged that already this morning. We've confessed our sin. We've been forgiven by you. And now we look for wisdom from your law. We look for life, as the psalmist says in Psalm 119. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I know some of you have read G.K. Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy. And those of you who haven't, need to. Uh, In chapter 9... He has a striking illustration, allegory, and he is addressing the objection that Christendom and the church have darkened and embittered the world. So he wants to answer that question. Is that true? And here's what he says. Listen. One of the things he says anyway. Those countries which are still influenced by the Christian faith are exactly the countries where there is still singing and dancing and feasting and art in the open air. Christian doctrine and discipline may be walls, but they are the walls of a playground. We might fancy some children playing on a flat, grassy top of some tall island in the sea. So long as there was a wall around the cliff's edge, they could fling themselves into every frantic game and make the place the noisiest of nurseries. But if the walls are knocked down, leaving the naked peril of the precipice, they won't fall over. But when their friends come to see them, they will all be huddled in terror in the center of the island, and their songs ceased. So much for Chesterton. In that allegory, the walls stand for the Christian moral framework, the commandments of God. God's law functions as guardrails in any society or nation, and they ensure a healthy, joyful, productive culture. Take away the fencing function of the law, and you have chaos and anarchy. It's this social function of law which I want to highlight this morning. There there are traditionally three uses of the law. You've heard these before, many of you. Three uses, the pedagogical use, which drives us to Christ. It's a schoolmaster to drive us to Jesus because we recognize we're guilty and we need forgiveness. But the second use is the civil use of the law. The use is politicus, the political use. And the law serves to secure a civil order and serves to protect the righteous from the unjust. And then there's a third function, and that is it provides us a standard to live by as Christians. God's righteous character is embedded in the law. It's the second and third function which I want to highlight this morning so that we appreciate what we've inherited from our forefathers, Christendom, and what we need to maintain 
and restore if we are going to have a healthy Christian culture for ourselves and our children and their grandchildren. The Decalogue is graciously given by God to Israel and, the, and Christian people for the purpose of forming a distinctive type of culture, a free society organized for peace and prosperity. Think about the story of the Exodus. The people were living in slavery for 400 or 250 years, however you do the math in the genealogies and chronologies, a long time. They're in slavery. And the prologue to the Ten Commandments is, I'm the Lord your God, I'm Yahweh your God, the personal covenant of God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, and into freedom, basically. And so what you have in the Ten Commandments is not, strictly speaking, a legal covenant, not a covenant of works, so that if the people would just obey these laws, then God will love them and favor them. That's not what's going on. God has loved and favored them. God has shown grace to them. And now, here's another gracious gift that God gives. All these laws, so that you can have a stable, prosperous, free culture. You've been living in slavery. Remember in Exodus chapter 1, they were building Pharaoh's house as slaves. And the book of Exodus ends with them building the Lord's house, the tabernacle. And, the, and then at the end in Exodus 40, the glory spirit, glory cloud of God coming and identifying with that house. So now they are free people. And so they've been redeemed. Always remember this. The law, the first function of the law is not to condemn us. The first function of the law is because God has been gracious, he gifts us with the law so that we can we can live. That's the idea. This is true all through the Bible. It's true in, in the garden. It's true in Israel. It's true in the church as well. It's true in all the books of, of the Bible, especially the, the epistles of Paul. The epistles of Paul do not start with theology and then practice. It's grace and then law. They're covenantal documents. So, let's think about this a little bit. What I want to do is go through each of the Ten Commandments, take about ten minutes for each. <laughs> take a few minutes for each. Um, and ask this question, what kind of social order do these commandments create? First of all, they create a community of people that put their trust in the true God and forswear allegiance to all false gods and idols. What do we have on our pennies and our coins? In God we trust. And the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, that is a commandment to trust God. Wow, so the commandments begin with a call to have faith, to put your allegiance in the true God. Have no other God. It's almost it's marriage language. To have and to hold. I'm Yahweh, your husband. You're my bride, the people. Or Jesus says, I'm Jesus, your husband. I died for you. And now here's how you should live. Okay. That's what's going on here. Always uh, amazes me that people fail to see that the first commandment is a commandment to have faith. So that faith and law are not opposed. There's no dichotomy there. They're, they're unified. So God commands us after delivering us to trust him. Okay? But if a community, if a community of people does not trust the true God, then someone else will step in and play God. And that is most often the state. Do we trust God or do we trust the state? Second word, second commandment. What kind of community of people are we creating here? We're creating a community of people that worship God in a fitting way, rejecting the dehumanization that inevitably results from bowing down to lifeless p 
pictures and carved images. Read this commandment carefully. It is not forbidding the creation of art and images in, in, in the abstract. It is forbidding the bowing down to those carved images, those human artifacts. No bowing down to art, to icons, to statues. And note the importance of ritual worship, of bodily obeisance before lifeless images. That will produce stunted people. You know, twice in the Psalms, Psalm 115 is an example. We are told that the nations worship, they bow down before lifeless images. They have eyes that do not see. They have ears that do not hear. They have noses that do not smell. They have mouths that cannot speak. They have feet, but they can't move. And what's, what's the conclusion? All those who worship them will be like them. Now, we can, we, if you notice in the scriptures, you can bow down before people. <laughs> Abraham bows down before people. All, all sorts of people bow, not in a sense of giving them divine worship, but respect and honor, but not before images. If a community of people worship God through the medium of lifeless stone statutes and static images, they will dehumanize themselves and bring judgment upon themselves and their children's children. This commandment has this awful addendum. Judgment on children's children to generations, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and love for God is shown when you don't worship this way. Number three, a community of people that bear the name of God in a glorious way in our daily lives, renouncing hypocrisy and double-mindedness. Okay. It's important to read this commandment right because it's been narrowly conceived too often. Thou shalt not bear the name of God in a vain way, in an empty way. Now, we think take the name of the Lord your God is all just about speaking, you know, and a lot of our catechisms, unfortunately, focus on that. But this is about the Israelites bearing the name of God. They, they bear the name of God before the nations. They're called by the name of Yahweh. And it's also about Christians who, at our baptism, the name of God is placed on us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are called then to live in such a way that we bear that name in a glorious, weighty, beautiful way. And if we don't, the Lord will not hold us guiltless. Okay. We have, we have, this is the whole story, the whole failure of Israel. Israel is called to be a light, a witness to the Gentiles. So that when they saw how they lived and the law that they have, they would say, oh, what a glorious God this people have. We want, we want that for ourselves. But in the end, you know, Romans 2, Paul talks about this. He says, the way they behaved, especially at the end, the name of God, the name of God, the name of Yahweh was blasphemed among the nations because of you, Paul says to the Jews. We cannot have that happen as Christians. We should not. A culture that bears the name Christian does not behave as such will not be able to hide from God's righteous condemnation. Number four, a civilization that safeguards people from the slavery of never-ending work and frees them to gather for worship on the day of the Lord. And we can talk about how that's changed and shifted in the new covenant, which it has. But it's still grounded in God's work in creation in Genesis 1 and 2. Okay. And this, this, is, this is so important because Israel was enslaved in Egypt. And God wants them to experience the freedom that comes from working six days, but resting 
on a seven. But when cultural authorities, and, and I, I need to say this, the, the sab, notice how the Sabbath is phrased. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to Yahweh your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock. Notice that in order for the Sabbath to work, it has to be enforced culturally. Because the manservant and the maidservant can't keep the Sabbath unless their master gives them the day off. Same with the livestock. Same with sons and daughters. And it's true in a general sense, too. Today, we have all sorts of authorities that have lifted, lifted the, what were called the blue laws. And so you can, you can be forced to work seven, eight days a week. Now, most we still have the vestiges of a Christian culture, so that doesn't happen too often anyway. But it has to be enforced because the little guy can't stand up to their employer and say, I'm not going to work on Sunday. You're gone if you say that. Employer has to be legally required to let his people off. Okay. But when cultural authorities effectively enslave people by not allowing them to rest and or denying them the freedom of assembly for worship, then the culture is in danger of an Egyptian-style judgment. Number five. This will be a culture that honors and obeys parents and others in authority. And that is deeply suspicious of revolutionary insubordination. Okay. Sometime, break out the Westminster larger catechism and read what it says about the fifth commandment the sins forgive the sins uh, the, the duties required and the sins that are forbidden read it and it's all about superiors and inferiors and what is required of those that are parents that are superior over their children and what's required of children but there's a whole social dimension to this commandment that is largely missed by people today. It's not just about parents and children, because remember, kings and queens are styled parents as well. Now, that we can take that in a paternalistic sense, which is bad, but still, it's a biblical idea. Okay. A culture that encourages dishonoring of parents and others in authority will soon descend into anarchy or totalitarian social control the sixth word number six okay. thou shalt not kill thou shalt not commit murder this would be a culture that protects the life of the innocent and executes swift punishments against those that attack and kill humans made in the image of God the basic concern here, protect the life of the innocent. But if a nation refuses to protect the like, the life of the innocent, think of all the ways that our nation is failing to protect the life of the innocent. Innocent victims of crime, the unborn, the elderly, all the ways if that's the kind of nation we're going to become, then the entire culture is liable to be put to death by God. Just remember what happened when Manasseh shed so much innocent blood in Israel. They were exiled. They were gone. It easily happened to us. Number seven in the Decalogue, the seventh word. This would be a people that remain true to their marriage covenants, even when it means sacrificing, suffering, and self-renouncing commitment. Okay? The basic concern of the seventh commandment is the maintenance of the marriage covenant. And adultery is not simply sexual immorality. The commandment is not, do not commit sexual immorality. There are other commands in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, that say that. But here... 
This commandment forbids violating one's own or someone else's marriage covenant. Remember now, all of these commandments, as Jesus summarizes them, are either about, well, actually both about love for God and love for our neighbors. So if we really love our neighbors as ourselves, and by the way, love your neighbor as yourself doesn't mean you have to cultivate some kind of self-love first, and then it means love your neighbor as you would like to be loved. That's what it means. Love your neighbor as your, as, just as you would like to be loved. That's how you should love him. And if we really have a deep and genuine concern for the future of our culture and for the future of the culture that our children will inherit, then we will work to maintain our marriages by sacrificial love for spouses, resisting the powerful temptations to find sexual pleasure and fulfillment outside of marriage. And when we fail, as many do as Christians, we will repent and seek forgiveness and start over again. But an adulterous people will experience the unraveling, not just of the marriage covenant, but of all lesser forms of covenants and contracts. The marriage covenant, I think, is that important. Number eight, this is a culture that respects the right of private property. Thou shalt not steal. That means that we have a right to private property, that our neighbor has a right to his private property, and that we should not violate that right. We steal because it's a lot easier to steal than to do the hard work and to accumulate the wealth that God promises for those who work hard. And we do this cost-benefit analysis, and we see that we can afford to take the risk to steal because the payoff is so much better than working and saving for a long time period of time. And then what happens is we come to believe that we're little divine beings that cre can create wealth out of thin air or take what is not ours and make it ours. When in fact we are stealing goods from people to whom God has given it. Others have worked hard. God has blessed them and we take it away from them because we can either by doing it directly or by voting in politicians who promise to steal for us. A nation full of thieves will themselves be plundered. You're seeing how all this, I got two more to go, but I'll go quickly. You're seeing how all this works. The law of God is not just for, not merely for individual holiness, it is that, but it's so much more. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. This would create culture where the courts are respected, justice is the norm, and people testify honestly. So in the previous commandments, God has prohibited murder, adultery, and theft. And these commandments safeguard life, marriage, and property. But only if there's a just legal system in place. And even with a just, fair system of courtroom justice, a lying witness can sink the entire thing. Always remember this. No matter how good the laws are, how efficient the institutions of justice may be, if the people that function as judges and witnesses are corrupt, no society can survive. So we all know John Adams' comment, we are not a government of laws, but of men. Excuse me. We are not a government of men, but of laws. I just switched that. There's a reason I did that. We'll find out. But it's not simply true that we are governed by laws and not people. Good laws are not enough. The rule of law is fine, but laws don't rule. People do. Laws don't adjudicate cases. People do. Laws don't testify in court. People do. 
What is the shocking example of this in the history of the world? What is the most horrifying crime ever committed by humanity? The most ridiculously bad, awful courtroom trial. Jesus. And this happened in the nation that had the most just, most righteous, most amazing laws ever. And the people, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the rulers, the elders, didn't matter how great the law was, they brought false witnesses and crucified their Messiah. No matter how good a system of laws, if dishonest, immoral people administer and adjudicate laws, people lie in the witness stands, there can be no hope of justice. Number 10, last one. Wait a minute. Number 10, thou shalt not covet. What does coveting have to do with community? Notice also God regulates our desire here. Isn't this just about each individual's heart and desire? It is. But how does regulating our desire serve to establish a peaceful and prosperous culture? Here's how. The tenth word seeks to establish a culture where people are content with the gifts which God, with which God has blessed them. Guarding their hearts against all schemes that would deprive their neighbors of wealth for the purpose of enriching themselves. Another way of saying this is that coveting and envying your neighbor's gifts and property will result in social unrest. Again, the Westminster Larger Catechism has a fascinating explanation of the tenth word. Very clear. Question 147. What are the duties required in the Tenth Commandment? The duties required in the Tenth Commandment are such a full contentment with our own condition and such a charitable frame of mind toward our neighbor as that all our inward motions and affections touching him tend unto and further all that is good for him. What are the sins forbidden in the Tenth Commandment? The sins forbidden in the Tenth Commandment are discontent with our own estate, envying and grieving at the good of our neighbor, together with all inordinate motions and affections to anything that is his. Notice how social that is. And notice what we're going through right now in our country where we are experiencing the politics of covetousness and envy. It is not going to end well. So, this is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of our Lord God, Jesus as Lord. And the kingdom of God is God's way of organizing human life under the lordship of Jesus. Jesus. And that social dimension of the law, although often obscured in American evangelicalism, needs to be, needs to be uh, enforced and taught again and again. Keeping the law is not about maintaining your personal holiness only. It is that. But when you do that, you contribute to a peaceful, prosperous, free community and culture and nation that assures people will have freedom and enables them to be productive. As, I, as we began, these are like guardrails around the precipice. And as long as they're there, and people keep them, and when they fail to keep them, confess their sin and repent and change their hearts and minds and lives, when this happens, we will be like children playing and singing and dancing and art and food and feasting and family and all the rest. That's the promise. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for your law. I pray that we would keep it, not just for ourselves, 
but for others, for our neighbor, in order that our children and our children's children will be able to experience the freedom that you have promised us. In Jesus' name, amen.